thousands of years ago, the Earth passed through an exploding star and was showered in molten gold. The Incas called gold the sweat of the sun and told their stories with it. The Egyptians saw it as the breath of God and buried their pharaohs in it. I kind of think that gold has a, an allure that is rooted somehow in our collective unconscious. In India, the golden temple of Amritsar is a sacred destination, a reminder of how most of the great religions celebrate gold. In all of the world, no other word still evokes such wealth and power. If, if you ever look at gold, it's an extremely beautiful, I, I mean, I'd rather have a gold coin than a, you know, a mass of paper dollars. The gold coin is gonna survive forever, and the paper dollars are gonna be destroyed. The Romans called gold the muscles of war. With gold, a triumphant Napoleon gilded Paris. To finance the Third Reich, the Nazis were determined to capture the gold of Europe. Gold was the ultimate guarantee of national survival. Even today, gold shines in the world of high finance. Gold is the largest commodity market on the planet Earth. They make billions of dollars in a single day by manipulating the market. From China in the East to America in the West, the question ricocheting around the world is simple and troubling. Where is the gold? Is America's gold in Fort Knox? And if so, who really owns it? I think you have to assume that all the gold's not there. How is it possible that for every 100 ounces traded on electronic exchanges, there may not be even one ounce of real gold backing it up? The term Ponzi scheme comes up. The customer or client thinks he or she has something, but doesn't. There's not a lot of it. All the gold ever found would only create a cube 70 feet by 70. Even melted down, it's just enough to fill three Olympic swimming pools. Yet gold's magic continues to keep us in its thrall. When Moses descended Mount Sinai to deliver the Ten Commandments, he flew into a rage, finding his followers worshiping gold, a golden calf. Today, Western central bankers get almost as frustrated at those who stubbornly value gold over paper money. While India, China, and Russia buy gold by the ton, the big Western nations would prefer gold remain in a museum. Here on Wall Street at the American Museum of Finance, the precious metal is commemorated by a solid gold monopoly set. The museum director, Richard Silla, is not so sure that gold's day is done. The golden rule is really those who have the gold rule. In the world's great financial centers, New York and London, billions of dollars of every kind of metal are traded in the blink of an eye. Gold and silver are traded in code, where the flick of a wrist can spell hundreds of millions of dollars in profit or a disastrous loss. Andrew McGuire has moved in that world as a precious metal trader for decades. I've specialized in gold and silver trading for the last 30. In fact, I view gold and silver as my children. I know everything about the gold and silver market. I know why they move, and I know who's behind it. The drama revolves around bullion banks, giant international banks licensed to deal in gold and silver. McGuire says that week after week, some gold and silver traders bragged about how they used insider trading to manipulate the price of silver and gold. But it was a bottle of champagne that drove McGuire to become a whistleblower. When I see somebody celebrating with a thousand pound bottle of champagne because they're high-fiving each other because they took the price of silver down, on the other side of that are real people with real lives. What set me off was the realization that when you manipulate a commodity such as silver or gold or corn or oil or whatever it might be, it has a real world impact. McGuire says those market fluctuations don't just hurt investors, but they can have a devastating impact on mining communities in countries like Bolivia. 
Many point to the drop in the price of silver in 2008, from $21 an ounce to less than $9, as a prime example of market manipulation. The entire communities lost their jobs, and in some instances, there were suicides. And that really, really got to me, and I thought, you know, something has to be done here. Gold mines are just as vulnerable to market manipulation. Extraction of the precious metal from the ground has changed little in thousands of years. To produce one ounce of fine gold requires an average of 38 man hours, 1,400 gallons of water, and liters of cyanide. In South Africa, 400,000 men, 90% of them black, toil in mines deeper than two kilometers in temperatures greater than 130 degrees. The history of gold is stained with the blood of those who toil for it. Its dark power has been used for centuries to finance everything from war to mass murder. Historian Duncan McDowell. Countries with gold were countries that wouldn't be pushed around, that could fight wars, that could build up their economies. So this notion of gold as being the kind of foundation plate of national sovereignty was fundamental to the way the Western world saw itself. Gold was a driving force in the Second World War. In late 1938, Austria welcomes Adolf Hitler as a conquering hero in the land of his birth. But the image of a powerful Fuhrer cloaks a surprise weakness. Behind the scenes, the head of the German Central Bank has a bleak message for his leader. Hallmar Schacht warns Hitler that Germany is bankrupt. Its gold is spent. Hitler fires him. But Hitler will soon go to war not only for territory, but for gold. In 1939, Hitler captures Austria and Czechoslovakia without firing a shot. A special Nazi unit seizes their gold. Next, the Germans invade Poland. Poland fights back. The Polish army and resistance are ordered to hold out long enough to get Poland's gold out of the country. 75 tons of gold, worth billions of dollars today, are launched on a perilous journey through Romania, Turkey, and Lebanon, traveling south and east before arriving in France. But the gold would not be safe for long. In June 1940, Germany invades Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, and France. The 14th of June, 1940, the Germans occupy Paris, which surrenders without a fight. The Nazi gold squad arrives here at the Bank of France, demanding the gold of France, all three billion dollars worth. But historian Didier Brunel says they were met with a big surprise. They demanded to go into the vault and saw that it was empty. Of course, they were furious. French central bankers had planned for this moment for years. Ever since Hitler came to power, the French began hiding the gold in 51 separate caches around the country, always less than a day's drive from an escape port. Now France prepares to get the gold out of the country. In a secret operation from cities large and small, the gold is moved at night, dispatched to ports along its coast. The German army is not far behind. Historian Tristan Gaston Breton says everyone was trying to disguise a growing panic. There was panic, and we had to use whatever was available. Warships, merchant ships, trawlers, fishing boats, anything we could find to evacuate as much gold as possible. It was a masterpiece of successful improvisation. Today, these Atlantic harbors are home to sailboats, cruise ships, and ferries. In the desperate summer days of 1940, virtually the entire French Navy, including battleships and aircraft carriers, is mobilized to save the gold. 
Westward goes the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. 83 million glittering ounces, more than the cargoes of all the ancient Spanish treasure ships combined. The gold of France and Poland, bound for safe haven in Canada and the United States. It's still unknown how many ships carrying gold and silver bullion were lost to German submarines during the two world wars. Those sunken bullion ships and many from bygone wars prove irresistible to companies like Odyssey Marine. No story about gold is complete without a treasure quest. It's all very modern. Odyssey is even listed on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. The company operates out of a secret location in Tampa, Florida. President Mark Gordon says there is no shortage of wrecks. The United Nations estimates there's three million shipwrecks uh, on the ocean floor. The only way to transport wealth until the mid 20th century was on ships. So there are billions of dollars of gold and silver littering the sea floor. It's pretty amazing. Tom Detweiler was part of the deep ocean team that found the Titanic. Now he brings his skill to search for gold three miles deep. The sinking of one of these ships could cause large companies literally to go out of business, countries to, to take a different course in their history, and literally change the world. When we come back, gold and the ghost of Imperial Spain. and silver have always had a special allure for mankind. Since the dawn of civilization, men have been willing to risk everything for these precious metals. Odyssey Marine's Tom Detweiler. It was always something special, and one of the reasons is its permanence. It can lay in the bottom of the ocean for hundreds of years and come up and it's still shiny. It's still got all the detail in it. It's perfectly preserved. In 2007, Odyssey Marine was mapping the ocean floor off the coast of Portugal when they got lucky. It was a giant spill of gold and silver coins resting on the ocean floor. Odyssey could not identify a shipwreck in the area, which deepened the mystery, but immediately they knew they had something big. What we found really wasn't a shipwreck anymore. It was just the remnants of the cargo that had been aboard that ship. Lots of coins, because we found about 600,000 of them, and we know there's still many more down there. We suddenly realized this was a very large vessel that had had something very catastrophic happen to it. They transported the find to Florida. The trove was estimated at $500 million. Odyssey registered their find in a U.S. court to await any competing claims. And to the Spanish government, Spain argued that the treasure was from a Spanish vessel named Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes. It turns out England resumed the war with Spain by sinking the ship in 1804. Now Spain was launching a full-scale diplomatic campaign to get back gold it had plundered 200 years earlier. Peru also filed a claim saying the treasure was stolen from the Incan people. It is estimated that upwards of a million Incans were killed in unequal battle against the Spanish military or worked to death in the gold mines of Peru. Their claim was dismissed. The court ruled Peru was only a Spanish colony at that time and had no claim on the treasure. Even the U.S. government got secretly involved. A WikiLeaks document reveals that to help a wealthy political donor recover a painting lost in Spain during the Second World War, the U.S. government made an offer. If Spain would be kind enough to give this painting back to this family in the United States, that our State Department would help uh, Spain recover the coins that Odyssey had recovered. After spending $2.4 million recovering the silver and gold, another $2 million on legal fees, Odyssey was ordered by the court to hand the treasure over to Spain. Spinning a web of golden intrigue, once again, gold's spell proves enduring. 
gold taken by Spain two centuries earlier, was returned to the plunderer. Searching for gold in the 21st century is an expensive operation, especially if you can't profit from what you recover. Undaunted by their earlier loss, Odyssey Marine plunges ahead on another wreck. It's a treasure ship, three miles down, off the coast of Ireland, a wreck that meets the stringent criteria laid down by Odyssey's Mark Gordon. A shipwreck has to be worth at least $50 million uh, for us to go ahead and invest in the project, because it's very expensive. After making a deal with Great Britain to split the proceeds, Odyssey is pulling up tons of precious metal from a merchant steamer called the Gersoppa. On the 17th of February, 1941, the Gersoppa is carrying a cargo of silver bullion to fill a desperate coin shortage in wartime England. En route from India, she's attached to convoy SL-65. Running low on fuel, the ship slows down to five knots and leaves the safety of the convoy. She is hoping to make a run to Ireland's Galway Bay, 300 miles to the north. The Gersoppe is spotted by a German Fokker Wolf patrol plane. He radios her location to U-101. Commanded by Ernst Mingerson, the U-boat finds the Gersoppe. The submarine fires a single torpedo, which blows a hole in her starboard side. She sinks in 20 minutes. Only the captain survives. There were a lot of valuable cargoes moving during wartime. Ships carrying gold and silver because they had to pay for munitions, pay for supplies, pay the troops. The role played by the gold of England is one of the best kept secrets of the Second World War. In 1940, England stands alone. The war cabinet meets in this London bunker with the knowledge that France is in the hands of the Nazis and America is remaining steadfastly neutral. With a Nazi invasion that could come at any time, Churchill issues a secret order. To keep it out of Hitler's hands, all of England's gold must be dispatched across the North Atlantic to refuge in Canada. Historian Duncan McDowell. Britain wants gold not only in its own pocket in England, but it wants it stored offshore. In case, worst case scenario, Hitler comes across the channel, Churchill and the government has to leave and they have to run a government in exile. They want money to do that. Tied to the London docks sits HMS Belfast. It's a sister ship to the cruiser Emerald, selected for the dangerous task of transporting England's fortune. In the early summer of 1940, the first shipment is loaded aboard the Emerald. The gold is crated in small boxes, 2,229 of them, with a market value today of $9.9 .9 billion. The British realized it might look like their government was panicking, was preparing for the absolute worst outcome. So the British keep it very hush-hush. The operation codename is deceptively simple. Operation Fish. On the 23rd of June, 1940, the Emerald puts out to sea, destination Halifax, Nova Scotia. British coastal waters are especially dangerous. The Emerald is given a heavy escort for the first stage of the voyage. Then the cruiser is hit by a savage North Atlantic storm. It almost capsizes. On the 1st of July, 1940, the solitary warship carrying the secret cargo docks safely in Halifax. The small crates of gold labeled simply fish are unloaded under military guard and put aboard a secret train bound for Montreal and Ottawa. In Ottawa, the gold is stored in the vaults of the Bank of Canada. In Montreal, the precious cargo is put in the vaults of the Sun Life Building than the biggest building in the Commonwealth. There would be many similar voyages, but for the duration of the war, not a word leaks out. Coming up, questions about another of gold's deep secrets, Fort Knox. 
In the autumn of 1940, from Holland in the west to Hungary in the east, Hitler is filling his war chest with 600 tons of looted gold. The stolen gold buys oil and armaments from neutral countries like Sweden and Switzerland. Britain counters by shipping gold bars from Canada to the U.S. to buy weapons and warships. The law enabling the sale by neutral America is called cash and carry. The war, however grimly it, it turned out, was a huge kind of jolt to all the economies. And America, since it had stayed neutral, yes, could benefit from this uh, surge of, of British purchasing. Orders expected to reach a billion dollars for over 7,000 pursuit ships and bombers will mean jobs for additional thousands of skilled workers and a tremendous boom to the nation as a whole. While the gold of England helps lift America out of the Great Depression, the gold of France sits on the sidelines when it is desperately needed. Churchill asks France to release its gold to help England's war effort, which includes the liberation of France. The leader of the Free French, Charles de Gaulle, refuses. He says France needs the gold after the war to rebuild. Britain is in a really devilish position after the war, having used up their gold uh, during the war. The French have a kind of bounty waiting for them at the end of the war. But the French also have a shameful secret to confront at the end of the war, the Holocaust and the secret role of gold. In Paris, this is a memorial to 73,000 French Jews, rounded up by French police and deported to the Nazi death camps. Like thousands of Holocaust victims, many had deposited their savings in gold into safe Swiss banks, or so they thought. After the war, when families tried to claim their gold, the Swiss bankers demanded death certificates or other impossible proofs of ownership. That was the greatest revelation of the Nazi gold thing, that the Swiss suffered from this. They would no longer be that nation of uh, upright bankers and chocolate makers, you know, that they were as morally tainted by World War II as the rest of us were. An international investigation revealed that some of the gold held in Swiss banks came from Nazi extermination camps, pried from the teeth and fingers of the victims, then melted down and recast by the Nazis. It's called Totengold, death gold. In 2012, in one of the war's more macabre revelations, it was found that Hitler's personal dentist used Totengold to fill the Fuhrer's teeth. But most of the gold went to Switzerland. We now know in World War II that some of the Swiss bankers facilitated this laundering of gold right down to working with the foundries to re-refine it, re-stamp it so that it could be laundered into the European economy. The greed for gold drove the Swiss to trade for looted bullion even to Hitler's final days. In modern times, Profiteering has risen to another level. The gains are now counted in the thousands of billions of dollars. In one case involving precious metals, a large prominent bullion bank was said to be misleading its customers. Lawyer Samuel Sporn led the class action suit. I was approached about seven years ago by a gentleman by the name of Silverblatt, who had silver bullion, and he wanted delivery. Mr. Silverblatt, along with thousands of customers, thought they were buying bars of silver, silver in a vault, allocated or set aside in their name. Similar cases have arisen over gold. In addition to being charged for the silver, they were charged storage fees. But it appears there was no silver being stored. Nowhere is it stated in clear good English language that we are not purchasing actual commodity gold, silver, or platinum. It's only unallocated and it's a paper purchase. It's a position you have. You do not own the physical commodity. 
And then the customer says, my goodness gracious, I've been paying storage fees for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it may be. Why? The client is led to believe that he, she, or it has ownership. So that is the fraud. The class action suit was settled in favor of those suing before it came to trial. They recouped $4.5 million in storage fees, plus interest. When it comes to buying large quantities of gold and silver, traders speak a language very few would recognize. Contracts, contangles, and coiling. Algorithms and spoofs. Just a few words to describe actions that can produce staggering profits. Whistleblower Andrew McGuire describes a bank robbery, but in this case, McGuire holds the opinion that the bank is doing the robbing. It's no ordinary bank. It's a bullion bank, an international bank licensed to deal in gold and silver. We're showing this in silver because it's easier to see. But in gold, gold is the largest commodity market on the planet Earth. And yet, we've got the same thing going on in the virtual world of gold. Here's how it worked. Traders waited for most of the major markets from Shanghai to London to be closed. In New York, a gold and silver market called the Comex was open, and this is where they concentrated their dealing. This is a virtual world. This is not real physical. There's no numbered bars necessarily behind this. Essentially, you've created electronic gold and electronic silver. Trading anonymously, the players use what are called algorithmic trading systems to move in and out of futures contracts in the blink of an eye, 400 contracts a second. Each contract represents 5,000 ounces of silver. Suddenly, someone gets the idea to sell nearly 45,000 contracts. Such a massive wave of selling immediately drives the price of silver down. Investors, big and small, try to cut their losses and sell as the price drops. Anyone not in the game gets clobbered. I know people who trade in the hundreds of contracts, who lost, had everything taken out. Then, without warning, the mysterious seller reverses course and starts buying the electronic silver back. Once again, by massive buying on the electronic exchange, the trader dictates the price, making it go up and profits massively from the rise. The profit on each contract reaches $80,000. That's $80,000 times 45,000 contracts, $3 billion, $600 million. It is illegal. It's absolutely illegal. Under commodity law, you're not allowed to be dictating the price on the futures market. When we come back, Mr. McGuire goes to Washington as a whistleblower. I woke up at 2 o'clock one morning and said, you know what, that's it. I'm going to the regulators. I can't stand this anymore. When it comes to the world of gold and silver, it appears that throughout history, greed often takes center stage. Andrew McGuire believes he is confronting exactly that, as he alleges that some of the world's biggest banks were rigging the price of gold and silver and making billions doing it. In Washington, McGuire approaches Commissioner Bart Chilton at the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Their job is to police the trading of silver and gold. What we've seen all too often is where you have an individual trader who has excessive concentration. And when I say excessive, I mean concentration that can lead to pushing prices around. And we've seen it in uh, precious metals, in silver, in gold, and in some of the other commodities. To back up his story, McGuire proposes going online with the CFTC investigator and guiding him through the manipulation in real time. I was on live with him saying, right now, silver's going to go any minute now. I saw the signal come in, which is pretend offers and bids coming in and not trading. So suddenly, silver takes a drop. And I warn him just before, silver is going to go down below $15. Really, he had everything in his, in his hands, live and pre-warned, a bit like me saying to the police, there's going to be a bank robbery and an ATM machine at exactly 3 o'clock this afternoon. 
The scenario unfolds exactly as McGuire prophesized. It triggers a CFTC investigation. The Andrew McGuire circumstance gets into an investigation currently ongoing, but we're doing the best we can given the resources we, we have, and I think we've made some progress. But it's an uphill battle as a poorly funded and understaffed CFTC faces off against the massive lobbying effort by the banks. The investigation is ongoing. Across most of the world, the tallest building in almost every major city is a bank tower, cathedrals of finance. The Royal Bank building in Toronto takes the cake. Towering 41 stories over the downtown, it gleams golden in the morning sunshine. The answer to where's the gold? Astonishingly, it's baked into the windows. The glass of the 14,000 panes is cooked with 2,500 ounces of gold leaf. Now that gold is valued at over $3.5 million. The effect is spectacular. It is an appropriate setting for one of the world's most successful precious metal funds. There's a king of the fund is run by the billionaire philanthropist Eric Sprott. He says the history of the world is the story of gold. The oldest coin we have is from um, Ionia, and it's uh, dated 580 BC. And uh, some over here as well, I guess, that are Roman. Pinned to the wall in contrast is a trillion dollar Zimbabwe note. An inflated fate Sprott believes ultimately awaits most paper currency. All of the gold in the world ever produced is still above ground uh, because people don't lose track of gold. For his investors, it's critical for Sprott to keep track of gold. And right now, he's convinced there's something wrong with the arithmetic. He has assembled a team to track gold internationally, headed by economist Frank Veneroso, a legendary gold analyst. The gold market is a very shadowy market. It operates in all kinds of countries where there's very, very little in the way of organized information, data collection, what goes on with uh, central banks and bullion banks. They never tell you. They never expose themselves. In the year 2000, Venerosa conducted a forensic investigation of the movement of gold from government banks to the bullion banks. He discovered they had been covertly leasing their gold on a massive scale. Bank of England gold, for example, was leased to bullion banks. In turn, the banks took the rented gold and sold it. The way that was done is that there would be an armored car that would take it to Stansted Airport that would then be flown to Switzerland. It would be re-refined in a refinery in Switzerland, which then produced little bars and big bars, which were then turned into jewelry, which was then hanging on the women of the world, right? Where is that gold now? That gold isn't around. It's not in a depository anymore. Yet while the gold is gone, the Bank of England, or Fort Knox, for example, can still claim to own the gold because it's on their books as rented, not sold. It's a dangerous game. Gold has always been seen as the canary in the mine, a barometer measuring the world's economy. If we all woke up tomorrow and saw gold was up $100, you'd think one of three things. You'd think there's a problem in the financial community, a war has started, or somehow we're going into hyperinflation. That that's the message of gold. So what's happening now? Who is buying gold? And where is that gold coming from? Central banks in Russia and China are big buyers. A thousand in the uh, central banks. China, at least 500 tons. You got your ETFs are 200. So I got, I got 1,700 right there. I haven't even gone to the U.S. Mint, the Canadian Mint. I know what their sales were in 2000. The demand is huge. Can gold mines keep up? Sprott says no. There's actually only 2,200 tons mined that's even available to buy. Your conclusion then is there has to be an official sector supply, and it has to be very big. Yeah, I'm already up to 2,400 tons now using this data. But I think the elephant's in the room already. That's my view. Very brought. The elephant in the room is this. 
Western central banks are running out of gold, gold that cannot be replaced. Could the mystery begin and end at Fort Knox? Goldfinger. Many regard the Sean Connery Bond film, featuring a Fort Knox plot, as the best of the early 007 movies. It won box office gold, reflecting the world's fascination with the precious metal and what really might be going on behind the gates at the United States Gold Depository, guarded at the Fort Knox Army Base. The director of the American Museum of Finance, Richard Silla, says Fort Knox has a controversial history. At the height of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt ordered Americans to turn in all of their gold. Tons of coins, ingots, and jewelry. They were paid in paper dollars at $21 an ounce. What did Roosevelt do with the gold? Well, it was mostly melted down into gold bars and put in the federal gold depository at Fort Knox, Kentucky. So that's where the Fort Knox gold came from. It used to belong to all the American people, and then the governments nationalized it and put it in Fort Knox. The fort boasts a massive new vault in the middle of a fortified army base in Kentucky. That was the last time the gold was really counted. There's a yearly audit, but it's incomplete. The last full audit in 1954 was followed by a media show and tell in 1974. But a recent attempt to force full disclosure was defeated in the Congress. Precious metal billionaire Eric Sprott says aloud what many suspect when asked, is there gold in Fort Knox? <laughs> That's a good question. Um... There, there has been no audits since, I think it's 1954 or something like that. An audit would not be a difficult thing to do. I think you have to assume that all the gold's not there. By 2013, apprehension about the security of national gold reserves was not confined to Fort Knox. Venezuela took everyone by surprise by staging a political drama with gold front and center. It was really amazing to see people marching alongside the armored trucks bringing in the gold to the country. Nations like Venezuela know that blood, war, and conquest often flow like molten gold. In 1998, when Hugo Chavez was first elected president of Venezuela, he discovered that Venezuela's gold, once again, was in European hands, courtesy of the world's financial institutions. Journalist Eva Gollinger has written about the country's finances for years. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, told the Venezuelan government that in order for them to be able to secure loans and to prosper in the long term under this new type of neoliberalism, they needed to send their gold to be stored in banks outside of Venezuela. With gold brick in hand, Chavez began a campaign to explain to the people of Venezuela why he believed it was a bad idea for the gold to be out of the country. All told, 211 tons of bullion, worth some $11 billion, was held by foreign banks. And it wasn't until President Chavez realized that Venezuela's gold could be in jeopardy being stored in banks in the United States and in Europe where there were extreme financial crises occurring, that the gold of Venezuela could somehow be used by these banks to cure their own internal financial woes. Gold expert John Embry says Venezuela's demand set off a small panic on the gold market. Venezuela's gold clearly was not allocated, that is, set aside in a vault with Venezuela's name on it. It took a long time, and I mean, it put stress on the market because they had to go out and find enough gold to ship this, and it wasn't a large amount either. Chavez kept the pressure on. Six months later, the government threw a grand parade to welcome home the first shipment of Venezuela's gold. Like England and France during the Second World War, Venezuela came to understand the power of gold as a guarantee of national sovereignty. But other countries haven't been so successful when they tried to repatriate their gold. 
Most of Germany's gold is stored in New York at the Federal Reserve Bank, the Fed. But when the Bundesbank, the German central bank, asked to see their gold in 2012, the Fed appears to have refused access, citing security concerns. Now Germany's asking for the gold back. Eric Sprott is convinced most of the German gold is gone. Well, it's obvious they don't have all their own gold. I mean, they basically said that. We have some gold in our vaults and we have some gold elsewhere. And I don't think it's defined even how much they have in Germany. I would bet that uh, the Germans don't have access to the gold they think they own. Canadians, too, may be in for a shock. The nation's central bank boasts a modern headquarters that has won architectural awards. But no prize would be awarded for how they have managed the best performing asset of the last decade. The Canadian answer to where's the gold is simple. Except for a few bars, it's gone. All gone. Despite its international reputation for gold mining and mine financing, Canada has sold off its multi-ton gold reserve over the last three decades. I think it's important that the country, in order to uh, have some strength within the international financial community, has some gold. Gold analyst John Embry says a monumental shift is underway in the world of gold. What people in the West don't seem to realize, I think they're making a ghastly mistake, is that the people in the East, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, Indians, Russians, they delight in this opportunity to buy the cheap gold. So it's going west to east. And as an old adage, gold goes where the wealth is being created. I and mean, it doesn't say a lot about the future of the West. Behind the castle walls of the Royal Canadian Mint, modern alchemists are casting gold ingots and one ounce golden leaves to feed the growing hunger for gold. In each century, the stakes for gold get higher in the 20th century, gold became the ultimate guarantee of sovereignty, paying for world war and mass murder. In the 21st century, gold still manages to keep its secrets. Perhaps the biggest one of all, where's the gold and who owns it?